Welcome everyone. This is Dr. Shiraj Jaitley, your cardiologist on your favorite website, munimeterhealth.com, which is dedicated to teaching you about the human heart and about its illnesses and improving the clinical outcome from one end of the globe to the other. So thank you again for associating with munimeterhealth.com, your favorite video channel. Um, remember, this is mainly for medical fraternity, but also for general community as importantly, because we certainly want to improve the clinical outcomes. And I personally strongly feel that not only the medical education is important, but the patient education is as important because one can really improve the clinical outcomes by um, improving the adherence to the compliance for both medications, as well as clinic visits, as well as patients understanding the need for the testings, the diagnostic testings involved in improving their understanding about their illnesses and diagnoses. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to delve into the subject matter and the matter of the subject today being how does a stress MPI, which is obviously a nuclear stress test, impact in the understanding of a known CAD, in other words, a patient who already has coronary artery disease, how does a stress MPI impact on the understanding, as well as is there any incremental value, in other words, to understand the coronary artery disease that the person has? In the setting of a PCI, for instance, where a stent has been placed in the individual, for instance, okay? And in a setting of an open heart, where a person has already had an open heart uh, surgery, and we call it a coronary artery bypass graft, where it may be two vessel, three vessel, depending upon uh, how many vessels the open heart the person has had, where in individually in these settings does a stress MPI have a role? So before we delve into that, let's uh, look at my schematic here first. This being the heart, I'm looking at the external of the heart. Here's the aorta that comes out, uh, the valve, and the right coronary courses around the right border, goes to the inferior border here, and then almost ends at the apex. There's an important branch that comes out, the posterior descending. The left divides into two, forms a left anterior descending artery. And the left, uh, the other branch goes, courses around the left heart border. It's called the left circumflex. It gives off numerous branches. And again, this being a three-dimensional, so there are branches going in the back of the heart also, you can imagine through my schematic. And they all end towards the apex, if you will. And one branch uh, from one vessel uh, tends to uh, intermingle with the other and so on and so forth. This way the entire heart is nicely vascularized and, and, and substantially has enough circulation, uh, flow reserve, we call it the coronary flow reserve, both at rest and during the times of stress or exercise uh, induced uh, uh, stress, if you will. So the basis of stress MPI is that if you inject an radioisotope in, uh, via the blood, the coronaries will ultimately be supplying these myocardial beds, we call them the vascular beds, and there should be a normal perfusion in a setting where you have uh, physiologically open arteries. Now, if there are stenosis or if there is atherosclerosis present, at that point, certain areas will show myocardial perfusion defects, we call it, and they reverse during the time when you do the re-imaging in rest. So during stress, obviously that area may show, for instance, a defect which may be a, re a reversible defect, and later on during the rest, it will all reverse. Now, if it doesn't reverse, that is considered as a fixed defect. So there's a reversible defect and a fixed defect. Now, more details about the stress MPI have been mentioned on my other videos, which I strongly recommend that you should supplement your knowledges with. One is, uh, I'll quote you, the, uh, my videos are number 38, number 87, uh, number 115, if you will. And there's the one in Hindi, because we are uh, transmitting both in English and Hindi now. Uh, there's one in A07, that's a Hindi uh, version of my... So, uh, please supplement your knowledge by watching these four videos, number 3887, 115, and AO7, uh, to enhance the knowledge about the stress MPI first, or simultaneously, if you will. So having understood this, say somebody has coronary artery disease now in this setting, and there is an uh, obstruction. And there's uh, say there's an obstruction here in this setting, 
and there's an obstruction here in this setting. So you have about three vessel disease and it's known by a previously done coronary angiogram in that individual. Now, how does a stress MPI impact on that after the angiogram? Well, it's very important that the concordant studies have clearly shown that in the presence of ACE, uh, atypical symptoms or presence of actual symptoms, one can determine if you were to uh, subject this patient to go for a stress test the myocardial perfusion defects that will appear in these regions of question where you know that there is some evidence of obstruction. Are those obstructions physiologically important? In other words, are they, are they physiologically important enough to be revascularized? That is the big question. Have they impacted on ischemia or lack of blood supply distally that question can be answered by a stress MPI. Now take for example, here I draw the heart in the stress images and here I draw the heart again in the stress images. Now obviously say this is the stress image and this is your resting image. Uh, a defect say develops uh, somewhere in um, the interior septal area for instance here. And then that tends to reverse. Now here there is no defect, that reverses here. So that's called the reversible defect, if you will. So that is ischemia, a reversible defect is ischemia. Now take another example of a heart where you have the imaging looking the following. This is a stress image, here's the rest image. And if you look at, say, the inferior uh, wall was showing some, like the RCA, RCA will supply the inferior wall as you know. So there was a defect here seen at stress where the defect occurred and it's partially present now. So it's not completely reversed. This portion is reversed for instance, but this portion, so that's called partial reversible defect. That means it has an ischemia plus an infarct. It has what? It has both. So there is a fixed defect which has not improved, but there is a portion of that defect which is improved and that is ischemia. Take a third scenario where you have the heart where the defect does not improve at all. Now say you have an apical defect here. Let's use the same color code. Say you have a, a, a fixed defect here and the fixed defect also exists in the rest, both in stress as well as in rest. What is this defect? That's a fixed defect at the, say at the apical level. Say for instance, the LAD lesion which was distally perfusing this apex, and that remains fixed. That means either it's an MI, that means it's a, it suffered a heart attack, therefore it's fixed both at stress and rest, you see it in both the images, or it's an attenuation problem. That means there is an artifact, maybe because of the diaphragm being uh, too high, or maybe because of the breast tissue. Uh, so attenuation defects and myocardial infarctions, they both will appear like fixed defects. And that question will be only answered or, de or deciphered based on what the ejection fractions are and the wall motion abnormalities are. So remember, you have to see the ejection fractions and you have to see the myocardial perfusion. So let's move on to this here. So an ejection fraction during stress, if it improves from rest, from stress to rest, say the rest was 55% and at stress is 60% then that is a good normal phenomenon. That means from rest to stress, if it improved from 55 to 60, that's a good phenomenon. But the ejection fraction, if it drops down and you have say 45% or 50% of the ejection fraction starting from 55, that's an abnormal response. And in that setting right here, one should say, look, a fixed defect, it's not an attenuation, it's a myocardial infarction which is doing it. That means there is a fixed defect which is showing some element of dyskinesia that's present as well. Likewise, in reversible ischemia, you'll see a drop in EF. In partial ischemia, you may not see as much a drop, but in fixed defects, one may or may not see the defect uh, with the ejection fraction drop. However, the wall motion abnormality will become very, very important. This is wall motion abnormality. This becomes very, very important in a setting off, ruling out the myocardial infarction versus the attenuation or the, uh, the artifacts. So that means the artifacts will still show the wall motions normally, whereas the myocardial infarction will show dyskinesia. There will be dyskinesia 
or there will be akinesia. That means lack of the wall motion in that segment, in that territory. Wherever that territory is involved, the wall the walls will not come in. These walls will not come in during the stress. That means these walls normally come during the time when the uh, contractility occurs and in the presence of a fixed defect if these walls move outwards that's called dyskinesia if these walls do not move at all that'll be called akinesia so that is the understanding of stress MPI in a setting of ischemia versus infarct versus a known coronary artery disease now it is proven beyond doubt that stress MPI will not only tell us about the location of the various uh, um, myocardial perfusion uh, abnormalities, but it'll also define the extent involved. If the, if the larger the larger the defect, the smaller the defect, the larger the defect, the greater is the extent of the disease per se. More importantly, it is perfusing that area of the vasculature, and therefore that area of the left ventricle is under peril. And because the extent of the, of the myocardial perfusion defect is large, the, uh, it translates into the prognosis directly, uh, which is uh, the cardiac mortality as well as the coronary events, the non-fatal events, if you will. So the extent of the defect, it trans translates automatically to the prognosis, both for an MI as well as a non-fatal MI, as well as for the cardiac mortality. So it's very important not only to know which locations the physiological stenosis is important, but also the extent of the defect that it produces and tends to reverse or whether it does not tend to reverse. So stress MPI in nuclear cardiology is a very, very intriguing subject and a lot of studies are still ongoing and we're still trying to decipher a great deal of information. But just so that you know, it impacts not only in the setting of coronary artery disease, in the stents, as well as in the cabbages. Now, same applies, say, if you've had a cabbage here, there was a detour. Uh, there was an obstruction here and there was a detour here. So similarly, you'll dip, uh, you'll, when, you, when the patient undergoes for various testings, either you'll see a reversible ischemia or you'll see a partial ischemia, that is a mixed defect, ischemia plus infarct, or you'll see a fixed defect, whether it's a myocardial infarct or an attenuation. And the only way you can dis decipher between the fixed defect of a myocardial infarction versus attenuation is by looking at the wall motions uh, if there is a wall motion where it is seen that uh, the wall motions are coming normal, obviously that's an attenuation only, so that was just an artifact. But the wall motions are abnormal, like there was dyskinesia or there was akinesia, in that setting obviously one sees um, uh, these are related to MIs, dyskinesia and akinesia, that will be seen. Ejection fraction is another area which is a very important area where one sees that ejection fractions should improve during the stress when actually uh, the normal perfusion exists. But in the absence of normal perfusion, in the absence of normal perfusion, the ejection fractions will drop and that is considered as physiologically uh, important stenosis and those patients should be re-intervened uh, or re they should undergo re-intervention, if you will, and revascularization as the case may be. So all of this information really gleans so importantly to incrementally improve the prognosis and the understanding about the patient per se. I hope uh, I've been able to convey this in a very short uh, video vignette in this one. It's a very, very intricate subject, I fully understand. But again, the, uh, the students, the residents, the fellows who are undergoing uh, or, or taking the exams, hopefully this will, uh, this will be a good brush up before you go and take the exam. Also for my colleagues, if they are involved in practices, etc., you know, it's a good idea to just over a cup of coffee quickly brush up your skills and uh, improve your understanding about your various patients. I thank you again for your interest. Um, and watching MuniMeterHealth.com, your favorite website, and um, uh, and in, in your uh, in my in my video uh, series. Thank you again. This is Dr.